Welcome to Finding Proof, where we discuss all things early stage VC. We're your hosts, Thanasis and Jenny of the Proof Fund, and our goal is to get to know the best seed and early stage VCs out there. In this episode, we're spending time with Eric Manlunas, who is the founder and managing partner of the Wavemaker Group, which is a multifaceted cross-border venture capital firm investing in early stage out of Los Angeles and Singapore. Eric, thank you very much for joining us today. Look forward to hearing your story. I think you have a unique story because you have a, a venture firm and then you also have a labs business. You're also doing investments globally, right, here and in Asia. So I'd love to first hear you tell us the story of WaveMaker Partners and the WaveMaker Labs. Thanks for having me. So briefly on WaveMaker, I founded the predecessor firm of WaveMaker in 2003 here in Los Angeles, and we evolved to different directions since. So today, WaveMaker is a cross-border multifaceted early stage venture firm that focuses mostly in two geographies. One is in the U.S. Half of the investments in the U.S. are in California, half is outside of California. And then we also have a pretty big team in Singapore that tackles the Southeast Asia market. As you mentioned, our third leg, if you will, is our venture studio unit called Wavemaker Labs, where we focus on robotic and autonomous solutions in partnerships with some corporate partners. So overall, the firm is about 18 years old. We've raised over a half a billion dollars since inception and approximately have about 72 people across all the practices, mostly on the lab side. So Wavemaker Partners obviously makes investments. So you have a dedicated fund there. And which fund are you operating out of right now? In the US, we're in our fourth fund. And in our Southeast Asia practice, we're in our third fund. Okay, so you have a separate fund for Asia. Correct. Okay, and then for the Wavemaker Labs, is there a separate pool of capital for that as well? There is, but it's not a fund structure. We actually raised permanent capital on the Wavemaker Labs unit. So what we did was when we raised capital, we raised capital on a holding company level. Got it. So Wavemaker Labs operates essentially as a holding company structure. Got it. Which is typical for studio businesses, right? That's correct. Okay, That's correct. Great. So what is the strategy of the firm? Like how, what are you guys focusing on with this cross-border strategy? Sure. Uh, the DNA of the firm is really early stage and it reflects the DNA of the founders. We were all former startup founders ourselves prior to becoming professional investors. So we do nothing mostly early stage. I, I was going to say all early stage, but I'll elaborate on that later. So in the U.S., our model is a co-investment model. We will co-invest with trusted syndicate members and trusted leads, and we're tackling mostly enterprise solutions. So we're looking for industry pain points that we can understand and we believe are really acute pain points out there. And we're looking for solutions that would solve those and that would even disrupt industries. Similar to Southeast Asia, except for Southeast Asia, we tend to invest a little bit more with companies that have a deep tech angle to it. And we tend to lead a lot more in Southeast Asia. I'd say 90% of the time we would lead in Southeast Asia. And that's primarily a function of what we saw in the space when we started that practice in 2012. Because the firm was started in the US, I've been around here a little longer. So I've gotten to know the ecosystem. I've gotten to know a lot of the players. So there's a fair amount of trust that have developed over years. So that's why we are a lot more comfortable co-investing with people, co-investing in syndicates, et cetera. In Southeast Asia, it was a completely different situation. When we started that practice in early 2012, we did not see a lot of ecosystem players. So we thought that the best way to control our, our own destiny here is apply what we've learned in the U.S., but evolve that into more of a lead role. So our target ownership stakes in Southeast Asia is a lot higher than what we would typically target in terms of ownership stakes in the U.S. And the funds, as a result, have also become a lot more institutionalized relative to our U.S. funds. And what was the impetus and kind of thought process around creating the structure that you guys have with both having the different arms of Southeast Asia and the labs and the fund? What was the decision behind it? You know, to be perfectly honest with you, we were solving for our own personal problems. We wanted to have a lot more diversity. We wanted to have a lot more different activities rather than making just pure investments. The genesis of our Southeast Asia practice was really solving for a personal problem that I had, which is I wanted an excuse to invest in Southeast Asia. I was born and raised in the Philippines. 
and I've always been interested in how it would be like to be professionally working down there. I moved to the States when I was 17 years old, so I never really had the experience of working down there professionally. And we got lucky when we met Paul in late 2011. He was based out of Singapore. And when we first met Paul, the whole conversation was predicated on him potentially becoming an LP in our U.S. fund. But we hit it off quite nicely. Great background. He's a prolific entrepreneur. And during that conversation, I found out that he was also interested in building his own venture practice in Southeast Asia. So one thing led to another. We basically immediately invited him to the partnership. And a few months later, we had the Southeast Asia practice. The venture labs aspect of the firm was also solving for a need to have a lot more diversification, a lot more interesting things we're working on. And Buck was really, Buck Jordan, who run venture practice in our venture labs division is really more of a builder, a thinker and all that. And he thought that if, what if we built companies where we started our ownership stake at hundred percent and did the loot from there, what would that potentially look like? And we decided that for us to have a lot more stability and predictability in terms of capital structure, we needed to raise permanent capital for that business unit. So it's really just, we're, I guess, a bunch of ADHD guys and uh, just wanted to do a lot of different things. Are you focused on any specific verticals? I'd say in the U.S., we're doing probably two-thirds, three-quarters of our investments are enterprise software. Nothing specific there in terms of verticals, but we're looking for repetitive tasks that could be automated or bottlenecks that could benefit from automation. And in Southeast Asia, the same, except that the percentages of enterprise investments are much higher, probably closer to 90% these days. But nothing necessarily specific so we're still I would, what I would call a generalist firm with just a heavy emphasis on enterprise investments. Are there any trends or anything happening currently in the market that are really exciting to you at the time being? The secular technology trend, right? That, that whole technological transformation that I think started in the, the late 80s mm-hmm. continued to happen. So that remains exciting. There's a lot of industries that have not been transformed. So a lot of automation will still happen. A lot of technology could still be applied to a lot of different industries. So to us, that's a huge opportunity and it's quite exciting. And then we get a lot of thrill by seeing a lot of the stuff that we're doing in our venture studio side, Uh, a lot of the autonomous solutions that we're building from ground up. It's a different different animal when you're building something from ground up as opposed to investing in somebody that's trying to build something from ground up. So we're getting the benefit of both. Yeah. Do you want to highlight one or two companies that are coming out of the lab side? Sure. On the lab side, the most mature company is a company called Miso Robotics that sort of graduated already. It doesn't live at home anymore. It has its own space these days. I think it's about 45 people on their own, raised a bunch of money as well. They've built commercial kitchen helpers. What those are, are those robotic flippers. So they're essentially making the backside of the quick service restaurant a lot more efficient by taking over human repetitive functions, such as grilling, all those fryers that you have in the kitchen. I, so, I mean, I need one for mine. <laughs> <laughs> so we, so we, think, we, we think that's the future of QSR right. in general yep. because of the high labor turnover. And frankly, machines are really a lot more efficient than people when it comes to these things. You're not going to have any undercooked meals, overcooked meals, et cetera. Right. Uh, like I said, exciting, need one for mine. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Another thing that we're very excited about is a company called Pistro, which is a robotic pizza maker. I was really excited about that one because I love pizza. And if I can get a high quality pizza within three minutes coming from a machine, I'm all over that. So think of it as an oversized vending machine that's going to be populated across college dorms, cafeterias, hospitals, et cetera, wherein you can order a bunch of selections for that. So pizzas, get it to you fresh, not a pre-made, but literally made from scratch within three minutes. Wow. So I think if we can deliver that solution, that could be revolutionary in the quick service space as well. And it sounds like that's a popular one in the office. Absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> we just need to make sure that our recipe is pretty good. So we're, we're probably going to be partnering with somebody with an established recipe because we're not in the sauce making business. We're in the, <laughs> we're trying to make the machine and robots that will make those. And having been to your Santa Monica office, as we discussed earlier, I've, I can attest to the interesting surroundings <laughs> with a lot of robots around doing like interesting things. Yeah, don't, 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 don't tell the city of Santa Monica that we're running a sweatshop <laughs> in the office. Go on. <laughs> you had a lot of interesting machines. And talk a little bit about what's the model behind that when you partner with corporate entities or corporate sponsors of this work. 
Sure. So what we do is when we think of a lot of different pain points that are out there and we've identified something, what we'd like to do is to validate that with industry practitioners. In this particular case, let's say, for example, we have an autonomous lawnmower called Graze. We understood that cutting grass in general, in a commercial sense, think of golf courses, public parks and all that, is relatively a low margin business. Most of the margin for commercial landscapers come from more specialized services, such as tree pruning, cutting, planting, specialized plants, et cetera. Nobody really wants to just cut grass because one, it's incredibly boring. Number two, it's incredibly low margin. So we learned that problem, but as just investors, we wanted to make sure that actually is a valid problem. So we validated that with a bunch of industry players. Once we got the validation for it, the way we want to de-risk these types of things is we would engage a corporate partner who could potentially build it with us. But for the most part, we prefer for them to become potential customers. So in a particular case for Grace, we were able to secure a purchase order for, I think, approximately $22, $24 million for it. And in our mind, we've de-risked that proposition. We've de-risked that thesis. And then we just have to build it and make sure we deliver a fully functioning product. And once we get that done, we have a purchase order in place. And then hopefully we can really build a nice enterprise from there. And do you share the upside, obviously, other than just the machine? Like, is there a built-in ongoing revenue from services? There is a subscription revenue for a lot of these things, kind of like the HP model for the recurring aspect of the ink. A lot of these things are still being worked out in terms of the revenue model and the business model in general. But the idea is to have some margin on the equipment itself and then have a recurring piece of the business on a go-forward basis. And I think that's, that's when you really build nice enterprise values is if you have recurring streams coming in. And on the venture side, do you want to highlight a company from the Southeast Asia fund and, and the U.S.-based fund? Sure. In Southeast Asia, the company I'm most excited about is uniquely built and suited for Southeast Asia, and it's really an emerging market problem. It's a company called eFishery. It's in Indonesia. It's in Jakarta, and it's basically a IoT sensor for feeding fish. Unbeknownst to me and to a lot of us, I don't know if you guys knew this, but Apparently, there's ways that fish communicate underwater where, when, whenever they're hungry and whenever they need feeding. And historically, the way people have done it and the way fishermen have done it, and these are the aquaculture farm owners, is they've manually fed the fish based on certain times. Kind of like humans, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But most of the time when you do that, you tend to overfeed or underfeed because you really don't know when these schools of fish are really hungry. And what this entrepreneur has done is built sensors and figured out there is a lot of intelligence within those sensors and figured out the type of behavior the fish demonstrates underwater. And they have figured out when the fish is hungry and when the fish needs feeding or when the fish is full. And it's based on movement or it's based on this, on, on what? Based on a combination of movement and sounds. So think of finding Nemo, right? I guess they communicate amongst each other. So the sensors can detect the movement, can detect the sounds, and knows when the fish needs feeding. And that's when it releases the, the fish feed underwater. So they're fed properly. They're not underfed. They're not overfed. And there's a lot of efficiencies to be had there because if you overfeed a fish, they could die. When you underfeed it, it could also die, or at least the yield's not going to be there. So what this center has done is it's done it optimally to the point where it's just proper feeding, proper. And then so you get optimal sizes, you get optimal harvest. To me, that's quite exciting because it's not something that I would see in the U.S. per se, which is why there is a lot of, you guys asked earlier why we're doing all these different things is because it's really a lot of fun. We're learning quite a bit. So our Southeast Asia practice tends to find companies that are solving specific problems for those regions. They're not necessarily problems in the U.S. or developed markets. I feel like I'm in a movie now. <laughs> this, is, this is the example. <laughs> Wait, could the fish outsmart the system? <laughs> well, I guess if a fish... never know. There could be some greedy fish in there. <laughs> if, a, if a fish wants to game the system, I suppose it could, yeah. fake, it could fake those movements. It could fake those sounds and the sensors would be fooled into releasing more food, right? But I guess that doesn't happen often. No, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen, <laughs> doesn't happen uh, often. Yeah. Not that I know of, at least. Are there synergies that you gained by virtue of having a labs business and also doing investing? Give us an example of what insight you might have or how you might leverage, say, corporate partners in your investing that otherwise you might not. 
there are some synergies to be had whenever it's much, I don't want to use the word easy, but it's much less challenging to engage with a corporate when they know, for example, in our venture studio business, it's much less challenging to engage with a corporate when they know that we've been doing this a long time, when they know that the, the, the business started off as an investment practice and it evolved to a venture studio practice. It also helps to know that we've also seen other markets such as Southeast Asia. So it becomes much less challenging. It gives us more credibility to engage with a corporate when they know that we've been around a long time and we've done different things within the practice in general. In terms of cross-border synergies, there's much less of that. It was a very romantic model from the notion from the very beginning of being able to help companies that want to go to the U.S. from Southeast Asia and vice versa. But as a practical matter, businesses are local businesses and venture is practically a local sport. So we run these things autonomously and I'm the common denominator of all the different pieces because I'm frankly the oldest. So I'm bouncing around between Southeast Asia, the U.S. and, and our venture practice but they're run independently by Buck Jordan for the Venture Studio and Paul Santos for Southeast Asia. And I run the U.S. practice. There's less synergies in terms of helping companies go from one market to another, but we try to help when we can. We've had some examples where companies of ours in Southeast Asia want to penetrate the U.S. So we've helped from that perspective by opening doors, by sharing space with us, that kind of stuff. But for the most part, it doesn't happen as much as the romantic notion suggests. So tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into venture. As I mentioned, I was born and raised in the Philippines. My family migrated to the U.S. We moved from Manila to Miami, so at least same weather, when I was 17 years old in 1985. I went to school, I went to undergrad down in Miami, so lived there for about five years or so. And then after grad school, I moved to L.A. and ended up working for Arthur Anderson. I was in their retail consulting division. Did that for about close to five years. And I've always wanted to be independent. I've always wanted to do my own thing. So I gave myself essentially five years to work for a big corporate environment to learn what I thought I could learn. I almost lasted five years. I lasted four and a half years. And basically in August of 1995, I left the big corporate world and tried to figure out what's in store for me. I've always been interested in technology, but I'm not a techie or a technologist per se. I was a journalist and major in college. I enjoyed writing, but uh, I, I couldn't write code. But I got lucky around the summer of 1995 was around the time the, the first Internet 1.0, if you will, was being commercialized. And a lot of the iconic companies that we know and love today were being born around that time, Amazon being the most famous one. I thought that I could do this. I've always wanted to build my own company. I built, I started my first startup in September of 1996. It was an online specialty food retailer. So it's basically an, an early version of an e-commerce play back then called innerfoods.com. The inspiration ca came from a company called greatfood.com out of Seattle that was eventually purchased by, I think it was 1-800-Flowers. And the idea there was to find some hard to find European delicacies, hard to find European chocolates and sell it in the U.S., and so I did that after a couple of false starts, finally figured it out and scaled to a certain level where it was interesting enough for somebody to purchase it. So I had a nice successful exit around July, summer of 1999. And I wanted to continue the momentum because there's nothing more inspiring than tasting that first level of success. So I wanted to continue the momentum by building another one. So I partnered with another friend to start an ISP, an internet service provider. It's basically a plain vanilla narrow band connection. And the thesis was, what if we find a market in the U.S. that's underserved by the national providers and let's build a nice base there with the goal, essentially, of selling it to a national provider, we can get it up to, a, to an interesting scale. So we did that. I had a co-founder in the second one. I, I did not have a co-founder in the first one. So we did it. We built it up for about 50,000 subs. We've always thought that we can build it up to 50,000 subs that somebody would be interested enough. So we found an underserved market in the mid-Atlantic region between Lynchburg, Virginia, Mount Airy, North Carolina, and Martinsville, Virginia, a, a slight rectangular area there. And we were able to build that to about 55,000 subs. We were doing about a million and a half of EBITDA on revenues of about five and a half million by the time we sold it in December of 2002. So I was feeling pretty good about it. I, I was two for two. Those two successes, modest successes, gave me some options in life. And I thought that there was going to be a third startup, but I took a little bit of a victory lap, traveled with my family for a little bit. We had a four-year-old and a one-year-old at that time. So we spent a lot of time in Asia. 
And four months into it, I was itching to do something, but I really didn't have any third idea as an operating idea. So I ended up, I figured, you know what, why don't I become just a more of a formal angel investor? I'll raise a small fund. And essentially that was the predecessor company to Wavemaker, ended up raising an $8.3 million fund. I anchored it with my own personal capital along with six other guys. And we basically spread that out over 40 companies. And that's how, so I got into venture, essentially, my long-winded answer to that is by essentially starting my own thing. And I, I, I don't think I could have worked, nor probably, I didn't have the pedigree on paper to be able to work for these large firms, nor would I have been a good partner or a good employee for those firms. So essentially, Wavemaker became the third startup without me knowing it. I've always thought, like even six years into my investing career, I thought that there's always going to be that third startup that I want to build but as I got older and older, I guess the hunger became less and less. And, and building a startup is incredibly difficult, as, as, as you guys know. So essentially, Wavemaker became the third startup. You operate in a couple of different geographies, as you talked about. What are some of the differences that you see in the U.S.? And in the U.S., you operate in a market that is relatively hot, and the Los Angeles market has been very active. And then Asia is probably as well, but there may be a little different, so... In terms of hot being, meaning prices have inflated, Southeast Asia is also a very expensive market these days. I think it's pretty expensive across the board, across all kinds of ecosystems these days. The difference is really is that, as I mentioned earlier, we're seeing specific solutions that are being applied to local problems in Southeast Asia that's not necessarily available in the U.S., in the U.S., you tend to see a lot more of the same solutions that are solving pretty much for the same problems that most people are familiar with. A lot of it are automation software and all that kind of stuff. But in Southeast Asia, you really tend to see unique pain points that are not necessarily available in the U.S. Aside from the e-fishery example I gave earlier, I'll use an example in the Philippines and in Indonesia, for example, there are a lot of these small retail stores that we don't necessarily see in the U.S. We see a lot of 7-Elevens here. What we call that in developed markets are the convenience stores. It's the same concept in Southeast Asia, except that there's a lot more of them. They're, they're, they're very small. They're very, gra- they're very grassroots. And none of them are automated. So creating marketplaces for that type of environment is quite unique and not something that we would see necessarily in the U.S. Is it easier to raise LP capital in the U.S. or in Asia? Actually, you know what? It's much less challenging to race in Southeast Asia based on our experience, only because a lot of the LPs have started discovering Southeast Asia now, and they all want to get involved. And that's really how, I mean, I give Paul a lot of the credit, all of the credit, in fact, for really building that institutional practice in Southeast Asia. And the story has resonated because a lot of the, we have investors in the U.S. that want to discover Southeast Asia. They want to know what it is. And they believed in the trends that we saw 10 years ago. And if you really are playing the long game, there's nothing but upside in that region. So I'd say that it's probably, again, not to use the word easy for fundraising, because I don't think it's easy, for, at least for us, it doesn't really get any easier. You would think it would get easier, but it's not, it hasn't been the case. But it's a lot less challenging to raise for Southeast Asia, only because of the allure and the perception uh, a lot of the investors have in terms of its potential upside. And frankly, it's less players. In the US, it's a much more mature ecosystem, a lot of different players, a lot difficult to differentiate yourself. You guys call out the importance of authenticity, which I respect. Would love to hear your thoughts on that and what sort of indicators you look for in founders or management teams in order to validate your conviction that they are authentic. Yeah. So we look at that quite simply. A lot of VCs do claim that they have value add and I don't doubt for some of them, but for most of them beyond the money, there's very little value add. And so I've always been uncomfortable claiming that, hey, my biggest differentiation is value add because I can do X, Y, Z. And as a practical matter, I really can't do that because I'm investing in a broad number of portfolio companies. We'll have 40 to 50 companies per fund, which is why the model in the U.S. is a function of co-investing in syndicates because that's really the only way you can scale that. So we prefer to invest in entrepreneurs that can succeed with or without us. And we try to be as authentic as possible with them to say, hey, look, we're happy to help when we can. But for the most part, we've, we've had some entrepreneurs come to me saying, look, I like your background, the fact that you've built two companies in the past, and I think you can be helpful. And I would say, look, thank you for that. But keep in mind, my startup experience expired in December of 2002, different world back then. 
acquiring customers back then was a lot different than acquiring customers today. You guys are a lot more sophisticated today. So I don't know all the playbook today necessarily. I have an academic knowledge of them from a high level, if you will. We're sitting in an ivory tower observing and prognosticating from an ivory tower. But for the most part, we're still betting on the entrepreneur because we can't claim, nor do we claim that we can help you do the day-to-day blocking and tackling. So we tend to gravitate with entrepreneurs that are humble. We tend to gravitate with entrepreneurs that have built-in relevant domain knowledge and experience. And frankly, the ones we're deliberating is, can these guys or can this team succeed with or without us? Because if this team cannot succeed without us, I'm not sure we will necessarily increase their level of success or their chances of success by just giving them a check. Money is a great value add, but it's just one of a million value add that you would need for something to work out. That's a smart screen, I think, because if you're searching for entrepreneurs that need you, it leads to adverse selection a little bit. That's right. Yeah. Again, when you're investing in the jockey, you can't say, hey, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back you, but I need your help to make it succeed. I've never seen a formula work that way. Having been an entrepreneur a couple of times and building those things, it's nice to know that you can call your investor, but I, I didn't expect for them to solve the problems that I was tackling on a day-to-day basis, certainly not on a long-term basis. So now we're going to switch over to our four standard question segment, and we're looking forward to hearing your answers. Our first question is our National Venture Capital Association question. The MVCA advocates for public policy that supports the venture community and the American entrepreneurial ecosystem. If there was one thing that you would change about the venture capital industry or one policy that you would advocate for, what would it be? Yeah, and that is to further democratize the space. I don't know if the NVCA can do this themselves, but I'm hoping that they have a strong enough lobby with Washington that they can actually really, truly democratize the space. Right now, as you guys know, it's very exclusive. Only a certain level of the social demographics can invest, and it's practically based on implied wealth. I've always found it bizarre that the government doesn't have any problems letting everybody gamble in Vegas at a certain age, but they're not letting them put money into private companies. I understand why not. They're trying to protect the downside, but I think the policy is misguided. There's a lot of potential wealth creation that can happen with private companies. And if these so-called non-accredited investors are allowed to do that, I think that's probably one way to potentially solve the wealth and income disparity in this country. So that would be my wish if I had one to be able to advocate for the NVCA to be able to convince the powers that be in Washington to do that. And I think we're seeing a little bit of that happening already with crowdfunding succeeding and all that. But that's certainly one aspect that I think if you can fully democratize access to venture funds, I think it's a better solution than giving handouts and entitlements. Got it. Number two is if you weren't a VC and money wasn't a concern, what career would you have? I would be a high school basketball coach. (laughs) And the reason for that is I coached my kids, not in high school, I coached my kids growing up and they both ended up playing competitive basketball. I don't think I'm a good teacher per se in a classroom setting, but because I'm such a fan of the sport, there are a bunch of things that I can probably share with younger emerging kids as they enter their, the next phase of their life. The reason being is that I'm a big fan of the sport. And I think I'm a big fan of seeing all these future leaders of ours learn life over sports because of the competition and the collaboration that it presents. So I, I still tell my wife that at some point I will become a high school basketball coach. You'll see. Shout out to our <laughs> portfolio company Overtime that's doing some incredible things in this space. They're the best, but that's awesome. That's a good fact. Number three is who is someone that you look up to and why? I don't know him personally, but I can't help but look up to Elon Musk, obviously. What do you think I, of his SNL performance? I loved it. I loved it yep. from, the very, from the very beginning, from the monologue down to all the skits that he did. It, it's awesome. I've actually rewatched some of them on YouTube. It's not because I'm a big Elon fan. I am, but I'm not a fanboy per se. But I've never seen anybody really defy conventional wisdom by him going in and redefining the electric market space or just forget about redefining the electric market space or the electric car space, but just creating a car, creating a a competitive business in a highly competitive and capex intensive space. Nobody gave him a chance, but he did it anyway. That's one of the reasons. And of course, he's also done the same thing for space travel or for space cargo. So can't help but admire a guy like that. I'd love to meet him at some point and not to fanboy. I'm not going to force myself over lunch and and bid for an auction to have lunch for them. But I just want to be able to shake his hand and basically say, if we just had a thousand of you, 
this would be a much better place. Yeah, he's an incredible person. Number four is what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? The best piece of advice I've ever received, I don't remember who now, but basically somebody told me one time that train yourself to be comfortable being uncomfortable because life is going to be pretty topsy-turvy. It's never going to be predictable as most people think. People who plan think that all those plans will happen will be disappointed. Mm -hmm. So if you can train yourself to be comfortable being uncomfortable, you will potentially thrive in ambiguity. And the minute I understood that advice, and I think I was given that advice at an early age around college, I took it to heart. There's a lot of things that disappoint me and in my day-to-day -day responsibilities, but I think I've gotten to a point where those things are just occupational hazards and I just ignored them. So that's probably the best advice I've, I've ever received. I wish I could remember who did it because I'd give him a shout out or her a shout out, but sorry, I can't. Great advice. Eric, thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciated your time and enjoyed learning about WaveMaker. Thank you. It was fun. Thanks for having me. And follow us on Twitter at ProofVC or on our website at proof.vc. Thank you.